Let me begin by expressing my profound appreciation for this opportunity to share a story with you. And I just also wish to say good morning to everyone and just that you've had a good breakfast to start with. My presentation is about the experience of Antigua and Barbuda following the COVID declaration of the pandemic by the World Health Organization and the implications for finance. As I recall, it was a routine day in my office in St. John. And my chief medical officer rapped on my door and brought to my attention that the World Health Organization has declared a pandemic. And then I asked myself, then what? What next? I called the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, informed him that the World Health Organization has declared a pandemic, and the next step was for me to ask the Chief, Health, uh, Chief Medical Officer to bring me the document, that document published by the World Health Organization, so that I could understand what a pandemic is all about. Never before had I been exposed to any literature other than just occasionally that I would go to conferences and that subject would be discussed. But to find out what the actual legal meaning of a pandemic was very essential in guiding policy from that point. And then we had to face the uncertainty of a clear definition of the role of the World Health Organization. What's the role of the World Health Organization in a pandemic? And as minister, I discovered that the World Health Organization was not very helpful other than declaring that there was a pandemic. There was no scientific guidance about this virus, how it spreads, nothing. And so we had to sit back and wait. And one of the things that, one of the lessons that should be learned by all states is that when you're faced with these situations, you're basically on your own. It then becomes exploratory. Where do you get the answers? There were no answers yet. We did not know for sure where the virus was coming from. Some said China, some said other places. But yet, as a country, we were faced with this crisis. It didn't take very long for us to have cases of COVID-19 identified at our ports. And then you ask yourself, what next? We discovered early that we did not have the facilities and the infrastructure in place. We did not even have the screening mechanisms at the port to identify cases of COVID coming in based on symptoms. One of the first things we had to do was to find the resources. And I, I want to put this in the context that Antigua and Barbuda is considered a middle to high income country. And that is very, very fundamental for us in our ability to respond. And so immediately we were faced with the need to find money to purchase equipment to get additional resources in order to have a first line defense against the COVID coming into our territory, in, into our state. 
And so we assembled the cabinet and we assembled some of our technical in, uh, people who had some knowledge of uh, temp temperature screening and immediately we had to go to the market to purchase the equipment so that visitors coming off the, um, the aircraft and the ships would not have to face for a long time the invasive aspect of having a temperature right at your forehead. So we purchased this uh, equipment where the temperature could be read from a fairly good distance. And then we realized that COVID means spending money and finding money. Every decision of the government from the very inception had financial implications, every single one of them. So we did quickly get um, our borders equipped for screening and did fairly well. But then we realized, ladies and gentlemen, it's not only screening, but you have to decide when someone is detected or suspected of the virus, where do they go? <laughs> where do they go? If you're coming to a hotel, what is the role of the hotel as part of the surveillance mechanism? So we had to call in the hotel association spend several hours negotiating and discussing what mechanism necessary in the hotels. So we move from the port, now we go in the hotels, and how would they handle a case of COVID? We then had to say, we cannot leave it only on the hotels. We had to recruit individuals from within the government system to actually be physically present at the hotel to assist them in setting up their systems as well as to do the monitoring. Because people coming on vacation are not expected just to stay at a hotel, but they're going to take a taxi, they're going to go sightseeing, they're going to go into the neighborhoods, go to a local restaurant as part of their experience. And so we were interested in ensuring that no COVID uh, individual, who has, an individual detected with COVID uh, be allowed to roam into the community. But the most difficult part was this. When your residents and your citizens return home, what laws do you have to say to them, you cannot go any place except where the government has designated? So you cannot go home. You cannot go back to the villages. So very early on, the government of Antigua and Barbuda, through a law that was established in colonial times, realized it had the legal rights to designate quarantines, quarantine facilities. And so very early on, we were able to enter into negotiations with the owners of a four-star hotel, Hawksville Hotel, to, for us to lease that hotel exclusively to quarantine and isolate individuals who are detected with COVID. This did this not come cheap. We paid millions of dollars. And here again is another financial implication. No hotel is going to say, use my facility uh, out of charity, none. So we had to pay. Not only do we have to pay for the lease of the hotel, but we have to provide three meals three meals a day for everyone that was either isolated or quarantined. Now the issue of isolation is of particular critical importance because when you isolate an individual, it means that that individual has been 
uh, tested, the virus has been, they, they have been tested, samples have been tested, and they, they have the virus, it has been detected. So the workers at the hotels would say, well, if I am to deliver food to these individuals, I don't want to contract this virus. So you need to tell me how I'm going to protect myself. We then had to get thousands of PPEs that every individual who is going into any facility, even the quarantine facility, especially in the isolation facility, they have to be wearing these PPEs on a very, very strict rules. That in itself was a challenge because initially, initially, the PPEs were difficult to obtain. There was an embargo out of the United States on all related items after a period of time that we could not get. We had to uh, rely on some of our international partners to, um, uh, to assist us in getting these PPEs. And the cost of PPEs and other uh, related items were relevant in our, our, our uh, hospital as well as in our uh, clinics. So the financial implication was enormous, enormous. But the greatest challenge was what we do with tourism. Antigua earns about uh, conservatively 90% of its revenue from tourism. How do we handle tourism? So we have a situation in Antigua and Barbuda where we have dramatic loss of revenue on one hand and an escalation of cost associated with managing COVID. Just imagine, at the time when you need financial resources is the very time your revenue plummets. And we could not go to any international financial institution for any loans on concessional rates because we were considered to be middle to high income. So any borrowing of Antigua and Barbuda would be at the higher rate in the marketplace. That was the dilemma. Uh, do we have anyone um, in our audience from the Caribbean Development Bank? From uh, ECCB? And ECCB is here. Um, and, and in the context of the Caribbean, ECB, ECCB, and more so, the Caribbean Development Bank is an institution that must now play a pivotal role in the Caribbean states uh, responding to the pan any pandemic in the future. The Caribbean Development Bank has to come out of its traditional role and understand that the resources, the financial resources that are required for the Caribbean states must be provided through that medium. I want to repeat this. And the, the thing that we must never forget as, through this experience is that during the critical time of COVID, very early stages, within the first year of COVID, every state was on its own. There was no global solidarity. Everyone was scrambling for survival. No global solidarity. And this is why many of the Caribbean countries were plunged into debt as a result of the pandemic. There was no IMF, World Bank. They were not nimble enough to respond. There was no emergency fund at the time. 
respond to the pandemic. And under those circumstances, it puts a focus on the Caribbean as a region, how much and how soon it will put in place the capability and the capacity to respond to the needs of Caribbean states. We need the CDB in particular, and in the sub-region, ECCB, to be empowered in this uh, ECCB, uh, Eastern Caribbean Economic Union, ECCU. We have nine small states. And in a pandemic, why should it be that we have to go beyond these institutions and deal with big institutions such as the World Bank and so forth for basic financial support to manage an issue such as a pandemic. You know, the pandemic is like the climate change issue. <clears throat> we do not cause pandemics. The Caribbean do not cause pandemics. They come from other places. But small island states pay the highest price under the circumstances. We don't have the financial resources. We do not have uh, the, the, the infrastructure. And talking about in infrastructure, Antigua and Barbuda spends over $100 million, U.S., in putting infrastructure in place. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had to quickly put what is called an infectious disease center in Antigua and Barbuda on our own, finding the money. An infectious disease center was the, uh, the, the, the facility where we had to put all the high-level interventions for people who are seriously ill from COVID. You have all the respirators and all the other equipment that's necessary. So they were placed in a particular um, facility. Then we realized that the main hospital had a problem because in the ICU we were almost forced we forced, were forced sometimes to put some COVID patients in the ICU in the same facility, same space where you had people being treated for other diseases. And as you know how easily this virus spreads. And I would say in the future, we cannot manage pandemic in that manner. What it's going to require is that there are special facilities to deal with viruses of that nature, pandemic. So you do not have someone who might just have had a serious operation be in the same room with someone with a virus. And the reason why <clears throat> Antigua and Barbuda is able to open up its borders sooner than the other Caribbean countries was simply because we had these, thank you, we had these facilities in place. And what happened during that time, as soon as someone was detected of the possibility of having a virus, they went straight to these facilities. They did not go to our clinics and to our hospitals. It's an expensive way of managing, but it's the most effective way of managing. Because you, when someone from a village returns home, and you say to that individual, you are not allowed to leave your home 99% of the time, that does not work. They're going to leave their home. So what we had to do was to take our citizens and our residents and place them in quarantine and isolation. Here is where <clears throat> we have a political issue. And as someone said, the minister was not very popular. <clears throat> How do you tell someone from the village, you just cannot go home? People don't understand that. Why can't I go home? I must be allowed to go home 
to my family. But we had to make the hard decision. It was not popular, but it must be understood as a result of being able to isolate that virus and not um, having one individual going into the community and infect uh, several individuals. That was the best option available to us. I'll tell you a story. We had a man and people having too large congregation at funerals. And a particular day it was violated because the family felt no one has a right to tell us how to mourn. And this is a true story in Antigua. So they went to the funeral, violated the law or the regulation. And not only did they overcrowd the cemetery, they decided that they would have a little music as well and go in the street. As a result of that celebration, four of the people died from COVID. Four in one family died from COVID. These are the hard decisions. And I believe one of the most important discussion, um, Professor Lalter, is how you merge the responsibilities of doctors, nurses, and other technicians with this responsibility of government elected officials. That is an issue that was a torment during the past two years of COVID. Because many people felt that the government was be too active in the management of COVID. They define it as a responsibility of doctors and nurses and other technicians. That matter has not been resolved in the Caribbean. It becomes a lot more difficult when you add the element of the social media. That is indeed also a challenge. So the issue of fighting COVID must take into account the financial responsibilities that will be a natural, uh, what you say, that will naturally evolve from this pandemic. One of the things that must be done is that the Caribbean must now reflect on the experience in the different states and identify how we can restructure in the financial institutions the different programs that could make available the financial resources to states when they have a pandemic. And given the fact that it has been shown through the data that most of the people who are paid for are people who are not very well in the sense. And so financial resources must also be guided to the fight of non-communicable diseases. We need financial resources to fight non-communicable diseases. According to the data from our hospital, those who have diabetes, hypertension, and, obese, uh, and those who um, suffer from obesity, were 80, 90 percent of the people who died. And we are not spending enough financial resources on education in order for people to, to understand that through proper dieting that they could overcome some of many of these diseases. It's not happening. And so this conference is critical in, in moving a, 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 a further um, towards the goal 
of building the, the, the financial capacity in our states in order to finance preventive medicine rather than curative medicine. We are making an industry out of illness. The more money is made when people get severely ill, rather than spending the money in preventing the disease. We spend more <laughs> trying to cure the disease rather than the, uh, preventing it. That is fundamental. And we do not have enough program and financial resources um, directed in that regard. As I said, one of the things that we must do is to be very frank about our situation in the Caribbean. Unless we want to face the reality and speak the truth, we are going to be going through this cycle. We are going to be seeing our people getting sick, and uh, many of them will die prematurely. And the um, interesting thing, I think many of you would remember, I think it was in 2007, in Trinidad, when the Caribbean was the first region in the world to identify NCDs as a major problem in health. This Caribbean, the first region in the world. And this Caribbean is considered the region with the highest rate of NCDs. It's ironic. And this is now, it's in 2007, some 15 years? 15 years. And you ask yourself, what, why this has happened? Well, I'm going to wrap up now, tell you. We have to understand that this thing, the glorified culture of the Caribbean, where we consume and drink the wrong things are too, in, too much in abundance. We have to say to ourselves, we need to calibrate the way we consume. The way we consume. The young people in this country grow up seeing the elderly in the carnivals, see what they eat. I'm not against carnival, by the way, you know supposed to be a cultural event. It has turned into something else. But we must understand that if this thing continues, we are going to be losing too many of our young minds that we have trained. We lose them prematurely. The scientists and all of those we have spent millions of dollars educating grow up with the competence, the capacity to contribute, but they die prematurely. That's the challenge. And I'll end by making the point I tried to make yesterday, that the way to approach this now, which is urgent for me, is to build the capacity at the primary healthcare level. We have to pour more financial resources in our clinics, take it into the villages of our communities, let it be a natural way of living for our people in the villages to say, I am going to the clinic not because I'm sick, but I would wish to find out the status of my health. That's what we need. That is the culture we need to cultivate. And the way we're going to cultivate that is starting at the primary school level we I saw in Fiji, in Fiji, where in the primary schools, the teachers will show the children the amount of food in their hands, in their palms, that they should be eating to keep them healthy. So they have an idea of the proportion, rather than filling up the plate, they have an idea of the proportion. And not only that in Fiji, the primary schools have gone where the children will plant the lettuce and the lettuce eat them. Until they grow up a connection that they're responsible for their own health. They're in control of their own health. That is happening in Fiji. I think we have to take some lessons from those who have been successful. And the fact is, 
that we have to get the financial resources to build our primary healthcare facilities, have them properly equipped with competent individuals and the necessary technology. I trust that I have not exceeded my time. So I want to thank you very much uh, for listening to me, and I make myself available, Dr. Lalto, for any questions. Thank you.